Man, to think of it, a short time ago, I was in the warm, 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 even hot Pacific. And now here in San Francisco Bay in the cold, cold. And actually I got a cold, but uh, so I sound a little bit different today, but I'm here especially to meet Jackie and Jamie Spence. This is where they're located. Benicia, California is where the office is located for Canvasback Missions. We're gonna find out a lot more today because we get to talk with them in person. Stay tuned. Jamie and Jackie, good to be with you today, although it's a cold day on San Francisco cold. Bay. Cold. <laughs> it is, yeah. Not like the islands for sure. No. But I came here today because I want to find out, and I know the viewers want to hear, how did this mission start 38 years ago, or even it reaches back before that, doesn't it? It does. We started out just sailing our little 31-foot trimaran from San Francisco's Golden Gate to Australia's Barrier Reef. And on the way, we found God. Now, how long had you been sailing? Uh, Over 20 years. 20 years, so you had a little bit of experience under your belt. Yes, and Jackie and I are both uh, Merchant Marine Masters, licensed captain. And the boat that we sailed on was the second boat that Jamie had built. She built the Little Sea Spider, 31-foot uh, Sea Runner trimaran that we sailed for seven years to get to the um, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So Jackie, you mentioned to me when we were in the islands that uh, you and Jamie actually contracted with boat owners to bring their boats uh, out here during hurricane season. Right. Yes, uh, it's uh, difficult sailing up the California coast from Mexico and people like to sail down and then pay someone to uh, make the hard voyage against the winds uh, back up here. Were there any jobs that uh, specifically stick out in oh, your mind? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. There was the... Uh, the Sea Wolf. Um, sea Wolf, that was a 65 uh, foot wooden vessel built for Adolf Hitler. And we slept in the uh, same stateroom that Hitler slept in. And that boat seemed diabolical, like it was always trying to, to harm us in some way. Now this we was, brought it from Mexico up to San Diego. This before you're Christians. This but was before we were yes. Christians. You're, you're, yes. you're all feeling the evil of that boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were. Wow. Yeah. Well, tell us now, you, you talked about uh, sailing out through the, the Golden Gate, I guess, and that was a journey where God touched your hearts. And that's yes. right. Uh, before we left, a couple that we knew, um, as far as I know, they weren't Christians, but they gave us a little Christian book that said, God has a plan for your life. And here we were headed across the ocean with uh, kind of didn't know where our lives were going to go. And we believed that. And we were seeking God. Our entire voyage across the Pacific, we, you could feel the presence of God out there under the, the stars of the universe. So you had a little time sea. to read and think. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. God. And we knew there was a God. We were, so, but what's that got to do with me, you know? Jackie, I'm going to kind of look to you on this. Was God working on both your hearts a little bit at that time? Well, he probably was working on our hearts, but we weren't listening. Jamie and I weren't really interested in the uh, um, Bible or what anyone had to say about God. We just were going to do our own thing. And, and what was your own thing? Well, we were, um, we were sailing. We, we were seeking. We, were, we knew that there were some answers to the qu life's questions, but we just didn't know exactly where, where we were heading. Okay. So take me on this uh, sailing journey then. Uh, what's, what's the next thing in this evolution of Jamie and Jackie Spence? <laughs> well, when we started out, uh, well, we're the last generation of star navigators, actually, before GPS. And, but we weren't that good when we started out, and we got lost at sea. We were lost for three days. And that was pretty scary, especially at night. You don't know which way to go when you're lost. And I finally gave up on figuring it out because we were drawing lines on the chart and taking shots with a sextant and it showed that we were somewhere north of Mexico City in the mountains. North of Mexico and, City. And I, I couldn't accept that. <laughs> I wonder why. So I, I gave up on my own ability and I sat down in the cockpit and said, 
God, if you can hear me, send me a sign to show me which way to go. But you weren't now, a Christian or anything at this time. No, no, but I knew there was a God because stars that are so orderly that they can show you your position on earth, you know, that doesn't come out of chaos. We knew that there was a controlling uh, person somewhere, a controlling God. So but, he was speaking to you through the creation. Yes, he That's was. That's right. Very much mm -hmm. so. We knew there was a God. Birds of but, the air and the fish in the sea. I mean, definitely there was a creator. And hundreds of light years out there somewhere there's a God. But what's that got to do with me? But I told God how to fix it. I said, God, show me a sign to show me which way to go. So you'd asked him about, uh, Lord, where are we? we? We need a little bit of help here. Yeah, I asked God for a sign to show me which way to go. And within minutes, a little bird was hovering over my head. I could feel these wing beats in my hair. And then he flew to the north. I thought, I've never seen that behavior before. He came back and he hovered over my head again and flew to the north. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I did pray for a sign to show me which way to go. The little bird came back and he hovered over my head once more, one more times. And as he flew to the north, I took a bearing on the direction of his flight. And I turned the boat to that compass course and it took us to our destination. Now that took a lot of uh, faith, I guess, to turn the boat and follow a bird. Well, we <laughs> knew we had asked for a sign. <laughs> yeah. And what else could it be, you know? But that showed me that God heard my prayer. This God that's as big as the universe hears mm -hmm. my prayer. Why would he have anything to do with me? And he can control a bird. Who can do that? Who can control a now, bird? Now, I've got to ask, you're out there on the sea. What kind of bird was this? Did you recognize it? Well, I think God has a sense of humor, too, because the bird was a sooty turn. A turn. And turn. T-U-R-N. Uh, turn is what we <laughs> needed to do. We were going the wrong way. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Kazumi was about seven years old when she experienced ear infections in both ears. Her mother took her to the doctors, but they couldn't seem to clear up the infections. A couple of years passed and she began to lose some hearing. Her family saved up all the money they could and took her to another country looking for help. But all of the doctor's attempts failed. Two more years passed and Kazumi had lost most of her hearing. Her classmates tried to compensate by talking louder or standing in front of her directly so she could read their lips. Then a canvas back ENT super team arrived and did surgery on both ears. Kazumi's hearing was restored. For almost four decades, canvas back has been changing hearts and lives one miracle at a time. But your financial help is needed to keep this important work going. If you would like to volunteer or be a financial partner, log on to canvasback.org. Now, what happened next? Uh, you still, you didn't accept God, but this must have been no. a really big impression. But after sailing a little bit, Jamie and I decided that we had enough experience that we were going to jump off the edge of the world and sail from Baja, California, all the way to the Marquesas Islands to French Polynesia. And so we were preparing the boat, um, getting things ready, and uh, um, a little boat came up to us and said, hey, we want to give you all of our canned goods. We're hauling our boat out of the water. We want to give you all of our canned goods. And I said, no, 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 really don't need that. But they insisted, and we took those canned goods and um, put them, uh, stored them away, and I thought I'd never use that stuff. I just don't eat that kind of food. So we sailed all the way across um, the Pacific, we took 21 days and uh, ended up in the Marquesas Islands, beautiful islands, lush islands. You could uh, um, fruit all over the island. The, the, the women just sat there and waited for the fruit to drop off the trees. And after a while, Jamie said, okay, now we're going to do our next leg. We're going to go to the uh, Tuamoto Archipelago, which means dangerous archipelago. They are coral atolls. Um, and there's nothing on the island except for the coconut trees. So that was a three-day crossing, and Jamie said, hey, um, provision for six days. We're going for three days, provision for six days. So we sailed there, and it was too late for us to enter into the pass. 
and he said, let's hold off. I knew what was going to happen. This too, was the too calm. late because of tides? No, because I knew what was coming. It was a calm, the barometer dropped. I knew that a storm was coming, and I couldn't, it would be dangerous to go into the pass in a storm, and I couldn't get in before the storm hit. So we battened down the hatches, turned away from the reef. There's Fakarava Reef, and this storm would be blowing us right at that reef. So I started clawing offshore, getting as way, far as way as I could before the storm hit. To make a long story short, we got caught in the hurricane, and I was being blown down on that reef. I was holding up against the wind as much as I could. But soon, well, we tried to get star shots. I strapped myself in on the cabin top, and when we were on the top of the wave, I tried to get the horizon, to get the sun. But we did get a line of position that showed that we would clear the reef, but I knew that line wasn't very accurate. But I couldn't hold up anymore. The seas were starting to crash over the boat. One nearly washed me right off the cabin top. How high the seas were you? They reached as high as 55 feet in the big sets in the hurricane. Feet. It was like hearing oh. a, a, a freight train coming down. Boom, and it would just snap the tiller out of my hand. And at it's the just... top of the wave, the rigging would just shriek. And at the bottom of the trough, it would go quiet but the seas were breaking all around us. And if the sea was, say, a 40-foot sea, 10 feet at the top of it might be breaking, and that would slam down on us. It would sound like sledgehammers on the deck. You guys figured you and probably could die at any moment. The water was squirting yeah, in, uh, in every crevice and crack, and everything was wet. We started out our usual four hours on and four hours off. Before it was over, it was one hour off, walking around in a wet bed and one hour fighting the tiller. Jamie wrote on the hatchboard, I can make it. No, the sea spider can make it. Jackie and I <laughs> can make it with God's help. And so, so God is leading you through this storm closer to him. Oh, you know, there are no atheists at sea <laughs> in, a, in a hurricane. There's no atheists in a hurricane. <laughs> we rigged a, a uh, automobile tire with it dragging a chain behind the tire to the stern of the boat to hold her up into the waves because she was screaming down these waves and just a little postage stamp of a storm sole on the head stay to keep her head down and the tire to keep her stern up and uh, she would still reach 15 20 knots screaming down these waves we were in survival conditions for five days because we just couldn't get out of that hurricane. But in the end, we were out for 23 days. Now, do you remember how many uh, days that we provisioned for, Jim? Uh, six. Six days, 23 days. And the food that we survived on was the food that those people gave us a year before. And when we finally got to um, a port, I wrote to them, I wrote a letter to them, and it came back. It was returned, addressy unknown. And that was quite, quite uh, puzzling. In Baja, when they were giving us the food, I asked the man on board his name, and he said, I'm Dr. Angel. And I said, oh. what kind of work do you do? He said, I work on hearts. Now, I've never heard a cardiologist say, I work on hearts. And his wife said, I, I help my husband in his heart work. That's right. <laughs> Dr. and Mrs. Angel. Wow. And when we tried to find them and in the town that they said they were from, and Never no found record them. of them, no one had ever heard of them. No. So I don't know, I just don't know, can an angel have a boat and canned goods? I just don't know. <laughs> Canvas Back Missions has been changing hearts and lives in the islands of Micronesia for nearly four decades. Founders Jamie and Jackie Spence once ferried medical and dental teams by catamaran and ship across the Pacific Ocean. But when small hospitals were established on many island nations, the mode of operation changed, as did the needs of the people. To this day, however, these hospitals lack medical specialists to perform the most difficult surgeries. On an ongoing basis, Canvasback flies all volunteer super teams to the islands 
to conduct surgeries and to train local medical staff. Teams are usually comprised of specialists in the fields of gynecology, orthopedics, ophthalmology, ENT, dental, and others as needed. They dedicate two weeks of life-changing mission work to relieve the pain and suffering of the people. If you would like to volunteer for two weeks of life-changing work, log on to canvasback.org and follow the prompts to volunteer. So God saved you for his work. What's, what's the next chapter now in, in the life of uh, the two of you in Canvasback Missions? Well, um, after we recuperated a year from that, uh, from that hurricane in uh, French Polynesia, we set off for another island called Penryn Island. It was an island that had not been visited by boats, had been close off to boats for years. And we went there, um, and three days before we arrived, there was a little boy who had died of pneumonia. And uh, they had no medicine on that island, nothing that could have helped that boy. We had the medicine on the boat, and we just started thinking, I think that that little book we told you about, God has a purpose for everyone's life, it started working on our hearts, and we said, we want to do something with the skills that God had given us to help these people. So let's look at uh, from the time you received that book to this time now. How long? How much time About has passed? Three, three years. Three years. Three uh -huh. years. God never gives up, does he? He never That's gives right. up. He kept nudging us the, in uh, a quiet lagoon. Jackie had to leave the boat because of uh, family uh, illness in the family, leaving me alone in a quiet lagoon. And uh, I was sitting and meditating about God because by this time we were earnestly seeking. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. And we were seekers. We were seeking in all the wrong places, in Eastern religions and uh, shamanism, the witch doctors on the islands, you know. But we were seeking for the true God because after the bird incident of God showing me he was personal, um, I had to find him find out who he was. I thought he might be enlightened in a blash, blinding flash. I had no idea. But as I was meditating about God, about finding God, I heard a voice. I'm all alone on the boat in a quiet lagoon. And the voice said, it all began in Zion. I thought, what does that mean? And then I heard him. Look around the boat to see if anybody else was around. To see if someone was on the boat. This was a voice. Someone's on the boat. But then I heard an inaudible voice, if that makes sense. But it said clearly. But first, a little background. And then a Bible appeared before my eyes. Just there. Yes, this is. It, it looked real. You could reach out and grab it. It looked like I could take it and open it. So I knew something was unusual that was going on. I felt like it was God. And I had a Bible on board. I had carried it around. My mother gave it to me when I was 14 years old. It had my name in gold on the leather cover. So I'd always carried it all my life. And the cover was all beat up, but the inside pages were nice and clean and white. I started like any other book. I started reading in Genesis. And as I read that Bible, Everything that pointed forward to Jesus just lit up. It was very clear, even small, insignificant things that pointed forward to Jesus just lit up. Now, I've talked with you before, so lit up really means lit up. It just didn't in your heart, but literally on the pages. We were planning, when we got to Australia, to continue across the uh, Indian Ocean and go to India and see this Maharaj Sawan What's, What's his, his face? face? <laughs> yeah, that we've been reading. And we thought he could help us find God. As I was reading Genesis, the scripture came off the page and it just came up and stood in front of my eyes like this. And it said, you don't have to sail across the ocean to find God. Everything you need to know is in this book. And it went back on the page. Now I quoted that scripture <laughs> to people for a year until I quoted it to a pastor, and he said, where was that? I don't think that's in, in, in the Bible. I said, well, it's in mine. I'll show you. But I never could find that. You know, God can speak to you through the scriptures, even when it isn't written in the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you one question. How old were you now 
your mother gave the Bible 14. How old were you? I'm in my 30s. You're in your 30s. So, so mothers never give up. Amen. That's right. Give up. That's oh, my right. mother prayed for me every day of my life. Mothers never give up. That's exactly Amen. right. So another chapter now. How do we get to the point God had touched your heart on the islands about the need of the island people? What what happened next? Well, we started thinking about what we could do with our lives and um, and decided that we could build a boat, a, a larger boat, to go back to the islands and provide medical care to them. So uh, we ended up in Australia and a, uh, um, the newspaper came out to do a story on us and we asked the, na the community to donate pick shovels and mattocks to us and uh, to send it back to an island that uh, Stone had... Stone Age Island. Had, it was a Stone Age Island. So an atheist came on board and became our very good friend. And after hearing about what we were reading, we were reading in the Bible, he said, I know, I have a, a friend, you ought to meet him. And out came this... He's religious too. <laughs> he came out with a big bushy beard and black set eyes and a Bible under his arm and he got right into Daniel and Revelation. And Jamie and I went, whoa, you know, that's a little too much. But this, this, this man brought his pastor out and his pastor became our very best friend. You know what was interesting? Um, Max Mulligan is the name of the pastor. He and his family were our friends for a year. He never opened up that Bible to us for a whole year. But anytime he saw us on the street or any of the church members saw us on the street, they'd say, where are you going? Oh, we're going back to the boat to eat. No, you have to come to our house to eat. Have to come for tea. They want us through our stomachs. <laughs> and, and anytime Max was um, doing like a five day stop smoking plan or health assessment plan or anything like that or needed music to be played at a at a um, vacation Bible uh, school, he would ask us. He always asked us to come and help. I was always involved in everything that Max did and he was and I guess he still is the greatest friend I've ever had in my life. So it, all of this is happening at the time you're building a bigger boat now? No, no and we're thinking about it. We're thinking, and, and, um, this is in Australia, in, in Australia. Before, we're still living on our little 31-foot sea spider. And, and we had decided that we were going to sell that 31-foot boat um, in Australia, but no one came out. No one came out to see that boat. And um, um, finally, Max sat down after a year of listening us, to us talk about reincarnation and stuff like that, and he said, we're having a Bible study. And <laughs> he just slammed the Bible down on the desk. He said, sit down, we're going to have a Bible study. Well, when you've known a guy for a year, you're going to do what he tells you to do. <laughs> it's just like Jesus, you become friends first. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so he uh, told us about the sanctuary. That was our Bible study, and we thought, wow. About the tabernacle and all the details of all the symbolism in the building of the tabernacle, and that stuff I just read through real fast, you know. And what won me about that was, wow, this guy knows so much about the Bible. I want to study with him. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, Max said to us, um, we're going to have, there's going to be a camp meeting. And we want you to come down, and we went, oh, I don't know if we can be with all those Christians for over two weeks, you know? Yeah, we said, we'll go for an overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and we got down there, and our hearts were really open. Just, um, we're really touched. They, someone asked, uh, there was a pastor who said, you know, you want to give your heart to Jesus? And I stood up. I said, yes. So we, instead of continuing south to see a boat builder that we were looking at, we decided to turn back and get baptized. We were baptized in the Boyne River um, where the platypus swim. Everybody came out to this little camp spot. And then after that weekend, we went back into town and you know what? There was a note in our, in our mailbox. Someone had seen our boat and they wanted to, they wanted to uh, uh, look at it. And in, in fact, they bought the boat. And we, when we... When we told the people in the church about that, this was six months. We had tried to sell this boat without a nibble. And the, the people in the church, when we told them about this, so excited, wow, somebody's gonna buy the boat. They went, they oh, said, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, we know. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've been praying that someone would buy your boat just as soon as you got baptized. Amen, amen. <laughs> the boat was in our box when we came back from the baptism. <laughs> wow, God's amazing. God is amazing. Yeah. He's in control. So we um, sold the boat, 
we had uh, we had um, chosen the design of the boat that we wanted to build, and we came back to the United States um, to to look for a place to um, build canvas back. And uh, we went. Um, someone told us the best place for you to build the boat is in Astoria, Oregon. And we went, where is that? This was a missionary in Thailand who told us that. And where is that? Because so, we told him what we needed. We needed uh, a maritime community with people with knowledge and availability of boat supplies. So, so then we went to Alaska, and then that person we met said, Astoria is the place to build that boat. And we're going, what? Then we flew back to my hometown in New York, and the very day that we arrived, in on the front page of the New York Times was an article on Astoria, Oregon. Really? <laughs> so of wow. course we looked in Texas and we looked in California. We looked in Washington. <laughs> we looked in Washington and we thought, let's go look at Astoria. This is God's word, the turn again. Yeah. Turn where to go. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the day that we uh, landed in Astoria, it was sunny. <laughs> and, only only days. days. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the perfect place for us to build the boat. Just great. You know, everything we needed, all the resources we needed. Two aluminum boat builders in the town, uh, boat supplies, everything we needed. I could get on the telephone and have anything I wanted the next day. And you know, you think about starting a mission, you think, well, everything, if God called, called you to, it's going to be easy. The very, in the very beginning, it was, it was challenging our faith. We um, had to build a building to build the boat in. And we had gotten all the food together to do that. It had everybody, and we thought we had a whole group to come. And um, we found out at the very last minute that they weren't going to be able to come. And Jamie and I were just, just racking our brains and thinking, Lord, why did you call us to do this when it was going to fail? And the very first morning that we were going to build that building, um, I fed 21 people and thought, well, that's, we're not going to get that, make it to we're not going to, we're not going to be able to build that building. And by that afternoon, we had 62 volunteers show up from all over. We didn't even know them, but they had heard about this, this project and they came out. We had that building built in three days. My husband and I founded the Ministry of Canvasback Missions 38 years ago to serve the island nations of the Pacific. From those humble beginnings, our medical and dental super teams have been changing lives and bringing hope to so many people. Our teams volunteer their time and resources, and all of our services are free, but it does take funding to make it all happen. That's where you come in. Your financial support is needed. Please join us in changing lives one miracle at a time. If you'd like to partner with us, you can write us at 940 Adam Street, Suite R, Venetia, California, 94510. Or you can log on to canvasback.org. Call us at 707-746-7828. And thank you for watching. Please join us again for another exciting adventure. Remember, Canvasback is making an impact, one miracle at a time.